Hey everyone, I think we can go ahead and get started now. It is now 6.05, so welcome everyone to our Environmental Justice Pathways keynote lecture. I am so excited that uh, we have so many folks here that have joined us and we have our keynotes and I'm just, I'm thrilled that we are finally able to take part in this. And so again, my name is Haley K. Scott and I'm the Climate Justice Grassroots Organizer with Beyond Toxics and the NAACP Eugene Springfield. And I'm also the Environmental Justice Pathways Coordinator. And so we are gonna go ahead and get this kicked off. So just really quickly, um, just some housekeeping and Zoom logistics. So participants will be muted for the duration of the webinar. If you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And you can adjust how you view your screen at the upper right-hand corner. And so if you have any questions, you can also put them in the chat in terms of just any logistics or housekeeping. And here's our tech team, including myself, Grace, Crystal, and Michelle. So I am now going to just one more screen. So really quickly, I would like to thank our wonderful partners, Meyer Memorial Trust and the Center for Environmental Futures, and then all of our amazing sponsors who allowed this event to happen. And so now I am going to hand it over to Lisa Arkin, our executive director here at Beyond Toxics. Take it away, Lisa. Thank you, Haley. And welcome, welcome to everyone joining us tonight. We had over 400 people register for this keynote speech. And uh, it's been a wonderful environmental justice pathway summit so far. And we're gonna end it with this big bang with our marvelous keynote speaker, Dr. Mustafa Santiago Ali, and our equally marvelous moderator, Michelle DePaz. I'm going to introduce Michelle. And I just wanted to take this moment to say that um, she has such an illustrious career that it is so fitting to take the time to honor this woman and to celebrate that she's here in Oregon uh, with all of the folks here in Oregon who are striving for environmental justice. What an honor that she settled here and that she's working with Meyer Memorial Trust. So I'm just, my heart is fluttering. So um, here is her bio and it's substantial. And I'm just honored to be giving this introduction to Michelle DePas, who is the president and chief executive officer of Meyer Memorial Trust. Michelle began her career as a community organizer in New York and was the founding executive director of the New York City Environmental Justice Alliance. That's a membership network linking grassroots organizations from low income neighborhoods and communities of color in their struggle for environmental justice. Over three decades, Michelle has held leadership positions in philanthropy, government, academia, and the nonprofit sector where she is now, and has distinguished herself as a thought leader at the intersections of justice, community organizing, and politics. She is particularly passionate about social, economic, and environmental justice for people of color, women, indigenous peoples, and low-income communities. As a civil rights lawyer, she litigated racial discrimination and human rights violations at the Center for Constitutional Rights. Michelle recognizes the need to invest in the next generation and educate them on the importance of social, economic, and environmental justice. Early in her career, she taught environmental law and policy at the City University of New York and Michelle was responsible for creating the city's first green jobs environmental skills training program for young men and women of color. So let that sink in, I'm taking a sip. <clears throat> but it doesn't stop there. Michelle, as a Senate confirmed presidential appointee in the Obama administration, she led the creation of the Office of International and Tribal Affairs, elevating the agency's recognition of the sovereign rights of indigenous peoples in the United States. And as a program officer at the Ford Foundation, she created funding initiatives, 
focused on the intersection of environmental justice and community and economic development. This work included the creation of the Gulf Coast Fund for Community Renewal and Ecological Health, the first community-led grant-making national effort, which aimed to rebuild after Hurricanes Katrina and Rita. This included Regenerations, which was a national youth organizing program that linked environmental justice with reproductive rights, culture, and policy advocacy. <clears throat> In 2013, Michelle de Pas became Dean of the Milano School of International Affairs, Management and Urban Policy and Tishman Professor of Environmental Policy and Management at the New School. This was an incubator for the next generation of leaders. There, Michelle shepherded the graduate school toward a social justice focus, developing leadership and supporting project-based research to solve some of our society's most pressing problems around race, around climate, and sustainability. She also served as director of the New York School Tishman Environmental and Design Center, where she worked to position the New York School as an academic ally in the environmental justice movement by bringing scholars to the university to co-produce research on environmental justice issues, including the implications of the EPA's Clean Power Plan and Native Indigenous resistance movements working on climate justice. <clears throat> she has also actively served in dozens of philanthropic and nonprofit organizations throughout her career and currently sits on the governing or advisory boards of the following. The Nature Conservancy, the Center for Constitutional Rights, grist.org, and the Climate and Clean Energy Equity Fund. Each step along Michelle's professional journey has lent fresh insights into, into entrenched injustices across a broad spectrum of sectors and honed her conviction to overcome them. In each endeavor, Michelle has sought to build a culture of interdisciplinary collaboration and inclusion. That is exactly the spirit that sparked her interest in Meyer Memorial Trust to deepen its equity journey to a focus on racial justice. According to Michelle, her proudest recent moment was deepening Meyer's commitment to Black liberation through the creation of Justice Oregon for Black Lives. A that is funding that is Black-led and Black-centered for organizations working toward justice and systemic change. In closing, Michelle de Paz holds a bachelor's degree from Tufts University, a Juris Doctor from Fordham Law School and an honorary doctorate from Fordham University and a public of a master of public administration from Baruch College where she was a national urban fellow. I am so honored beyond words to welcome Michelle de Pass as tonight's moderator for the keynote speech of the Environmental Justice Summit by Dr. Mustafa Santiago Ali. Thank you for this opportunity, Michelle. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Lisa. I um, I'm, I listened to all that and said, who, who is that? Oh, okay. It's a servant, somebody who has been on the ground. I have been on the ground doing this work and I'm just so proud of the work that Beyond Toxics has been doing. So thank you so much for allowing me to be a part of this incredible, incredible keynote speech. So it's, it's an honor for me to be here with my friend and partner, Dr. Mustafa Santiago Ali. Mustafa and I have known each other for quite some time before we were even at the Environmental Protection Agency together. And so I have a formal bio for him, of course, that elevates him in all of his stature, in all of his worth, in all of his power. But I have to actually start out with saying, his power comes from transparency and speaking truth. 
when after I left the agency and I went to the new school, there was a lot of interest in speaking with people who were still at the agency, working hard every day, toughening out, toughening it out. But there were a lot of people that were leaving the agency. And I happened to know that Mustafa was really frustrated about the direction and the turn of the agency. He was trying to understand how this could actually happen in this world of today after we were on such a high of the Obama administration and such a low of the Trump administration. And I happened to be speaking to an E&E &E reporter and they asked me, do you know anybody who would, who would be interested in talking to us that's still at the agency or that's thinking about leaving the agency? And I thought it would be incredible if you could get Mustafa's voice because Mustafa has been leading this work at this 17,000 person agency, billions of dollars and trying to actually make a difference. And he did so through the National Environmental Justice Advisory Council, through grants, through on the ground work. Mustafa has been a servant leader his entire career. And I am so happy that he spoke to that reporter and brought his truth to light and created a, a moment of transparency for what is actually occurring. Thank you, Mustafa, for doing that. We all owe you a debt of gratitude. And I would say that with all the largesse that's happening that I know you're gonna be talking about, that your letter that you wrote was a seed to be able to grow this tree. Dr. Mustafa Santiago Ali is currently the Vice President of Environmental Justice, Climate and Community Revitalization at the National Wildlife Federation. Mustafa previously served as the Senior Vice President for the Hip Hop Caucus, a national nonprofit and nonpartisan organization that connects the hip hop community to the civic process to build power and create positive change. Before that, Mustafa worked tirelessly for 24 years at the US Environmental Protection Agency, working at the intersection of climate and social justice. Mustafa was a founding member of EPA's Office of Environmental Justice. And as we previously were talking about, he left the agency in 2017 after serving as the associate Assistant Associate Administrator for Environmental Justice and Senior Advisor for Environmental Justice and Community Revitalization. It is my honor to turn over the mic to my friend Mustafa so that he can give us some words of wisdom. Thank you, my brother. Thank you for everything that you've been doing. I thought you worked hard when you were at the agency, but I know I know now that there is no stopping you. It's 24 seven, but that's what we do as servant leaders. I give you all Dr. Mustafa Santiago Ali. Well, thank you, Michelle. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you for your commitment to our most vulnerable communities. Thank you for never ever giving up in the good times and the hard times. Thank you to Lisa as well for your leadership there uh, with Beyond Toxic Sin. Um, thank you uh, to each and every one of you who are joining us uh, today. Um, it's so critically important that we're in this transformational moment where we get to implement many of the things that we've known for a long time were needed. And that if we could just pull things together that we could actually make real change happen. Uh, I, I wanna also thank my NAACP family uh, for the incredible work that you have done uh, on civil rights and social justice issues uh, for over a hundred years now, uh, never giving up and continuing to push. And we know that we need you now today more than ever with many of the challenges that we see uh, around civil rights issues across our country. I would be remiss if I did not also thank my indigenous brothers and sisters um, for your leadership, uh, for your stewardship uh, and for the land that I currently reside on 
with both the Pamunkey and the Mattapanai and other tribes and nations. And I also would say that our indigenous brothers and sisters have taught us how to live in harmony with our environment, with our planet. The first principle of the environmental justice movement is honoring mother earth. I want you to think about that for a second, how different our world would be, how different our country would be, how different our relationships might be if we actually honored that first principle of the environmental justice movement, honoring mother earth. You know, I, I often think about that. And I ask the question, how did we get to the place that we find ourselves in now, both on the challenges that we face and also the immense set of opportunities that we have in front of us. And it brings me to a few different things when I think about this moment. It brings me to thinking about policy and how policy, and many of you work on policy at a very high level, at a very transformational level, uh, often without the resources uh, that uh, give you the opportunity to then translate that policy into systemic change. And I think about policy and that it can be one transformative. It can uplift people, but policy also, as many of us know, can also have devastating effects, dehumanizing effects. If we think about policy in relationship to our indigenous brothers and sisters, we know it was policy along with race that gave folks what they thought was the right to remove many of our tribal brothers and sisters from their lands, to take them away from culture, to try and uh, take them away from their traditional foods and a number of other things. And even because we have to call it out that we're in this COVID-19 moment, policy even played a role in the genocide sets of actions of exposing folks to smallpox, yellow fever, a number of other diseases that actually had just devastating effects. But luckily our indigenous brothers and sisters are resilient. Uh, they have been uh, experts at adaptation. And I think about our African brothers and sisters taken from their country, brought to this country and enslaved for free labor. That was policy that was a driver in that space. Policy said that women didn't have the same value as men that women shouldn't own land, that women shouldn't be able to vote. It was policy that set that framework in place. It was policy also that impacted our Asian and Pacific Islander brothers and sisters. When we look at the incredible work that our Chinese brothers did to help to make sure that our infrastructure was in place, the railroad system that was the superhighway of its time. And after they made that set of contributions, then placing the Chinese Exclusion Act in place to stop them from continuing to be able to come into our community. It was policy that did that. Policy said that Japanese brothers and sisters could be interned in camps. Even though we were in the middle of a war, there were others, Germans in our country and others who did not have to face that same situation. It was policy that did that. And we also know that policy put Jim Crowism in place. And we see the remnants of that even today in places like Georgia and Texas and a number of other locations across our country who are now trying to roll back basic civil rights and being able to vote and to be able to fully participate in the civic process. But we also know that policy has the ability to change the game, to actually begin to move us in the direction of many of those foundational words that our forefathers and foremothers uh, said that our country was built on. Policy, you know, moved us forward on civil rights in the 50s and the 60s, making sure that we had some of those landmark civil rights acts that, were, that are in place around housing, around voting, around access to basic amenities. Something I'll talk a little bit more about as we move forward. We know that the women's suffrage movement understood to address the policy. And now women, even though we are not where we need to be, but we've made progress in making sure that women have many of the things that should just naturally come as basic human rights. And we've still got work to do in that space. And we also understand that policy for those of us who work in the climate space, the environmental justice space and the sustainability space and a number of other spaces also began 
to finally get in place a safety net, if you will, across our country, making sure that we had both NEPA, the National Environmental Policy Act, and then the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act and RICRA and so many of the other acts that we all utilize, we understand that that was a part of policy that was so critically needed. But we also understand in those moments that policy has never been fully protective of communities of color, of African-American communities, Latinx communities, Asian and Pacific Islander communities, indigenous brothers and sisters, lower wealth white communities. There have been gaps in the process. And the reason that the environmental justice movement started was because not only was policy not being created and implemented in its fullness, on both the federal, the state, the county, and the local level, that policies inside of many of our respective organizations also were excluding folks from being able to fully participate, fully to engage, and to be fully protected by many of the priorities that the organizations, those conservation organizations, those environmental organizations, and a number of others didn't have a seat at the table, weren't that at that time focused on what was happening in those impacts in people's lives. So the environmental justice movement started because folks said, well, if you don't have a seat for us at the table, if you're not going to focus on what is going on inside of our communities, then we'll make sure that we take care of it ourselves. And in that moment, by folks not paying attention to what was going on in black and brown and indigenous communities, and even in lower wealth white communities, we placed ourselves at a significant disadvantage without even knowing it in that moment. I want you all to understand, and I share this message both in our country and across the planet, that we cannot win on climate change if we don't win on environmental justice. Let me say that again for folks. We cannot win on climate change if we don't win on environmental justice. You may be asking yourself, well, Mustafa, what do you mean by that? Why is it that we can't win on this issue if we don't win on environmental justice? We know that disproportionately, many of the fossil fuel facilities are located inside of our most vulnerable communities. And we also know that the folks who are living in those communities are dealing with the toxic exposures. And we also understand that when you are dealing with those toxic exposures, you also, in many instances, get long-term medical conditions liver and kidney diseases, heart diseases, all kinds of lung diseases. We have these cancer clusters that continue to develop inside of our most vulnerable communities. And we also know that those same emissions that have been making folks of color sick, shortening their lives, are also those same emissions that play a role in the warming up of our oceans and of our planet. Y'all do me a favor because you know, I was raised in Appalachia and a little bit in Michigan. And I believe that, you know, sometimes we have conversations about parts per million and parts per billion. I work with some of the best scientists around the planet. And so, you know, a lot of times, in many of you are educators in this space, you know, that that doesn't mean a whole lot to everyday folks. People often hear me talk about Mrs. Ramirez and Mr. Johnson and Mr. O'Leary. Those are everyday folks. Those are folks who are on the ground in communities, living life, doing work, and finding ways to properly connect with folks. Do me a favor, everybody take a deep breath. Just hold on to it for one quick second. Now let it out. You know, that's an autonomic response. It's something that we do every day, and sometimes we don't take it uh, you know, we take it for granted. We don't actually think about how incredibly important that is. And we don't think about how many communities across our country, both in Oregon and in other locations, are struggling for a breath of air. Now, I know our brothers and sisters in Oregon, when the wildfires came through, it became very apparent to folks how critically important it is to be able to have clean air. You know, in our country, it's interesting, the wealthiest country in the world. We have 100,000 people who die every year from air pollution in our country. More people are dying from air pollution than are dying from gun violence. And we can't turn the television on without unfortunately seeing someone who's lost their lives to gun violence. More people are dying from air pollution 
than are dying from car crashes. And almost everyone knows someone who unfortunately has been in that situation. You know, we've got 24 million people in our country who have asthma. We got 7 million kids who have asthma. And we also know that African-Americans and Latinx children are the ones who go to the emergency rooms and the ones who are losing their lives prematurely. And we've got work to do to address that issue. I will, there in Oregon, you know, 11% of the population, the adult population is currently dealing with asthma. And we also know that about nine to 10% of the kids are dealing with asthma. They're breathing and dealing with toxic air, which of course exacerbates many of the conditions that come with asthma. And of course, in this COVID-19 moment, we know that if you are suffering from one of those breathing difficulties, it can make you more vulnerable uh, to infection, more vulnerable to hospitalization. And also, unfortunately, and we've all seen this, it's touched so many families, it's touched my family, that we also know that folks are losing their lives. So the work that we do in this space is so critically important because there are places there in Oregon and places across our country like the Manchester community, a hardworking Latinx community that, you know, when you go there, if you got an old car and you roll down your windows, you feel like you're breathing in gasoline fumes, surrounded by all kinds of toxic facilities emitting into the air, into their bodies, into their lungs on a regular basis. You can go to the 48217 in um, Southwest Detroit. When the kids look out their windows, they don't get to see what you and I see in many instances. They see the flaring that's going on. They don't get a chance to see trees. Many of them don't get a chance to experience the outdoors. And when we're talking about air pollution, as you all know, it is not just a urban issue. It is also a rural issue. There was a study that came out about a year now and a few months ago that talked about our national parks and how 90% of our national parks are dealing with significant air pollution issues and impacts from the climate crisis. Think about that. The places that we go to actually be able to rejuvenate for some to get closer to God, for others, a place where you can finally rest your mind are dealing with significant air pollution issues. Let me ask you all a quick question. By a show of hands, hopefully somebody's sitting next to you tonight. How many of you have had a drink of water or beverage? Just raise your hand real quick. You know, it's interesting in our country, we got 60 million people, 60 million people who have dealt with unsafe drinking water in the last decade. We know that our water infrastructure is crumbling, but we also know that there are a multitude of ways that our water bodies are being impacted. We know that we have significant issues right now that's going on with PFAS, the forever chemicals and all of the challenges that it places both on our bodies and in these um, organizations and governments trying to figure out the best ways to be able to address that. And luckily we're in a moment now where we finally have folks who are honoring science, who are saying that these are significant issues that are going on. But we also know that there are a multitude of other impacts that are going on to our water bodies. And going back to honoring mother earth, you know, it's amazing that we don't honor water. Water plays such a critical role in our lives. It plays a role in a cultural and spiritual aspect. Many are tied to the water. You know, whether you are a person who uh, goes through a baptism, y'all remember the days when people actually got baptized by going down to the local creek or a river, um, or many of the other traditional re uh, religions actually understanding that truly water is life. It is a spiritual force and that we should not be allowing all these chemicals to actually be able to accumulate inside of our water bodies, whether we're talking about lakes or rivers or creeks and how it infects and connects everything, either in a positive or a negative way. We understand that many people are still traditional hunters and fishermen. I grew up in a community 
where when we went fishing, we brought the catch back to the elders in the community to make sure that they had protein, to make sure that they were taken care of. And we know that once many of these chemicals get into our waters, that they just have these effects that happen from time and time and time again. And even though we sometimes fail to make the connection between the air pollution and the water pollution, there is an interconnectedness that is happening in that space. That many of the deposits that are happening are because uh, of the things that are going on in the air space. And then they continue in this cycle that moves into both wildlife and moves into us and also drives the climate crisis. You know, the IPCC, the National Climate Assessment has shared with us, you know, the challenges that we're going to face if we don't get it together. I don't know a better way of saying that than then we need to get it together. We also know that there have been additional studies that have come out that have shown that we are going to lose a million species over the next couple of decades if we don't stop these various types of impacts that our lifestyles, that our economies have been supporting. We have the opportunity to actually make real change happen. We can stop what happened in Flint, Michigan. When we talk about water quality issues, there are two things that usually pop into people's mind. The first one is Flint, Michigan. And we know all of those babies, and I've held many of them in my arms. And it's something about when a child looks at you and says, am I gonna be okay? And you have to find the words to actually be able to respond properly to them by being honest, but also making sure that you are helping them to know that there are folks who are there for them and will continue to fight for them. You know, when we saw those children actually being lead poisoned, having neurological damage, and then knowing that there are over a thousand locations across our country that have higher levels of lead in the water than Flint did, then we know we got work to do. And we know that we need an administration that is gonna be supportive of that, both on the federal level and on the state level. And now we find ourselves in this moment where we also have to deal with some of the spraying that continues to happen. You know, it's interesting. There is this historical set of connections. And I was remembering some of the conversations and, and some of the experiences that brothers and sisters right there in Oregon have had to deal with, with some of the spraying that's been going on. And I remember growing up um, and there was spraying back in Appalachia where I was. And then as I began to get more engaged in this work and sitting down with elders in the South and in other locations and them telling me about dealing with uh, the exposures um, from both herbicides and pesticides and a number of other uh, chemicals that they had to deal with. And it took me back to my early days when I was first getting started working on environmental equity and environmental justice work and actually being out in the fields um, with a, a number of farm workers at that time and, and seeing firsthand the experiences of them sometimes being in the fields and people actually spraying while they were in the fields and how that continuum of those types of actions 20, 30 years ago, we still find those instances where people will justify the utilization of that and the impacts that happen to folks. And then the journey of one trying to get hold of the information to better understand the exposures that you've dealt with and figuring out how do I deal with these, these medical conditions that are associated with the exposures that are going on. And we know the last administration was not that concerned with people's health, was not that concerned with science, was not that concerned definitely with the issue of environmental injustice, environmental racism that we see um, still happening across our country. And we know that there are the agricultural related issues that are going on with runoffs and how it's impacting many of our water bodies. And then we also understand the value of regenerative agriculture and regenerative reforestation and how that can also play a significant role in helping to protect our water bodies, to help to protect our rivers, to help to stop some of the floods that are happening and a number of other things. And we find ourselves now in this transformative moment, a moment that allows us to have a government on the federal level that gets what many of us have been working on for years is crafting legislation in a number of different ways to meet the sets of challenges and flip those into opportunities. And state houses across the country, many of them are beginning to 
wake up. We know that there are those that there still needs to be a, an amazing amount of work. And let me just add this into our mix is that we have to make sure that we are also bringing the civic process strongly into our sets of work. If we wanna make sure that the right types of laws and statutes are in place, then we have to be playing an active role in both one, identifying, and then two, lifting up those individuals who can run for office. I never tell anyone who to vote for, but I do say vote for somebody who cares about your community. Vote for someone who cares about the planet. And that means that we have some active engagement that has to be in there. And sometimes our environmental organizations and climate organizations will create these, um, these, these divisions between the civic process and the environmental and climate work. And it puts uh, an additional set of challenges in the mix when we are not thinking critically and in a holistic way. And we often talk about intersectionality in our set of intersectionality work, then we have to make sure that the civic process is a part of that. And now in this moment, there are actually real resources to help us to do the work that's so critically important. You know, in the stimulus bill that passed not that long ago, that $1.9 trillion bill, there was $100 million that was dedicated to environmental justice. There was like $50 million on the monitoring side, another $50 million for frontline communities and states and others uh, to do some of the work that needed to happen. And then we find that we've got, got this $2 trillion uh, climate uh, set of packages that also is gonna be very helpful. And then we have $2 trillion around the infrastructure bill which is really important because we all understand that when we're talking about infrastructure, we're talking in a broader set of possibilities than just roads and bridges, which are critically important. We're talking about wastewater treatment uh, and drinking water systems, and not only in making sure that we're building those to be able to deal with the additional sets of stressors that will come uh, from the climate crisis. We're talking about new housing sets of opportunities and making sure that we are helping folks who had traditionally been placed in certain locations because of redlining in certain parts of the country, because of restrictive covenances, because of a number of ways that we push folks into sacrifice zones and then disinvested in those communities. We have an opportunity now to flip the script, uh, as my nephew would say, and making sure that the right sets of resources are finally going to the organizations that are finally going to um, the, the frontline uh, organizations uh, to our tribal uh, brothers and sisters and others to make the change that they see is necessary. And we've never had that in the past. And then just recently, the president announced his new budget. Now we all know that there is a number of things that will have to go on before that budget gets passed. But he also inside of that has 1.5 billion dollars for environmental justice and a number of other dollars associated to many of the other issues that are also connected uh, to the issues that are going on inside of our communities. And I say this is transformational because it gives us an opportunity to also do a couple of things as I close out. The first one is to make sure that we are properly getting prepared for what is coming. And when I say what is coming is the sets of resources. So I'm extremely grateful to you all for the pieces of legislation that you've been working on um, you know, there uh, in the Oregon State House. So we have to continue to take a look at what additional pieces of legislation are going to be needed. And we also have to make sure that our organizations are prepared to be able to um, properly navigate all the dollars that are coming. And then we also have to make sure that, that people have the capacity um, to be able to do the work. The other part that I'm seeing folks across the country do, and I know you there in Oregon are also thinking about this, is beginning to look at communities in a very holistic way with the sets of needs that are going on and putting those plans in place. And I've been trying to help folks across the country to understand that, you know, we have sets of opportunities around transportation and housing and job creation and a number of other areas in the public health space. And we need our holistic strategies so that there are on ramps uh, for the dollars that are coming and the new sets of partners that are critically important. And I'll share this with you real quickly. I, I hope everybody will take and Google a project that I've been a part of for a number of years. 
uh, the Regenesis Project in Spartanburg, South Carolina. It's so critically important that we begin to think in a very holistic way of making change happen, both doesn't matter if we're in rural communities or if we are in urban communities, we can make real change happen. That Regenesis Project took a $20,000 environmental justice small grant, leveraged it to almost $300 million in changes. Many of the challenges that our communities face um, are represented inside of that project. You know, whether you're talking about you know, impacts from brownfields and Superfund sites or old housing that is not energy efficient and also is dealing with a number of indoor impacts, uh, transportation routes, uh, the lack of jobs, um, and a number of other things. So I, I encourage folks to look at that Regenesis project because it's a great template and they're actually creating an institute there where leaders can come from across the country and see how to make real change happen how to empower folks, how to make sure that you're building wealth inside of communities, how to make sure you're addressing the public health impacts that are going on, and how to get people engaged in the civic process and be able to get people on the local government, on the county commission, into state houses, so that you can make sure that there is a full connection of all the sets of opportunities that are going on. And we know that if we do these things, then we have an opportunity to actually begin to address the climate crisis. And at the same time, change the dynamic that is happening inside of our most vulnerable communities. You know, Dr. King once shared that we come to these shores in different ships, but we're all in the same boat now. I want y'all to think about that. You know, we're all in the same boat when it comes to COVID-19. Yes, disproportionately, folks of color have been dying at higher rates, but everyone has been impacted by COVID. When we look at the racial injustices that are happening, even sometimes when you don't think that you're connected to it, the ripples of it have impacts in all forms and fashions throughout our lives. And when we look at climate change, we know that we are definitely all in the same boat. We're in the boat that can have a North Star that is moving us in a direction of making positive change happen, of embracing a new clean economy, of making sure that we are honoring the work that has happened in the past and a new set of opportunities in the moment and in the future. And we also know that if we come together, there's nothing that we cannot do. We've proven it time and time again, but we've got to honor the voices of frontline communities. We've got to make sure that policy is just um, and has real meaning because it is anchored in what everyday folks are actually asking for. If we do these things, we can make a transformative change happen. We can create 21st century organizations and we can make sure that we have 21st century policies that give us an opportunity to win. I'm Dr. Mustafa Santiago Ali. I'm looking forward uh, to our question and answers. And thank you again for the amazing work that you continue to do each and every day. Mustafa. Thank you so much. Those are words of wisdom that uh, people were just throwing all these different questions into the chat. But before we get to those questions, I wanna spend some time just talking with you about where we see the environmental justice and climate justice movement these days, digging a little bit more into successes that we know and how we can plant the nuggets and leverage the resources that are coming out from the Biden-Harris administration. But first, thank you so much. Thank you so much for your lecture. So let's start talking. Let's start talking about uh, this movement that we care so much about that we've been working in for decades. And you know, when I came into the environmental justice movement, uh, it uh, toxics was really the undergirder. Uh, the fence line communities. In, you know, in Louisiana, you know, I was working on a sewage treatment plant up in Harlem that was never built right. And there was a consent decree. I mean, we were, we were dealing with noxious odors, health, livelihood, pollution, asthma. And now, and now we are at a incredibly expansive space. It's like, it's, it's intersection, you know, what people used to ask me, why are you, why do you do this work? I said, because I can actually work on any aspect of my life, mm -hmm. uh, where I eat, live, breathe, play, 
And so where do you, where, as you see, you know, here in Oregon, there are some incredibly strong institutions that are working on these issues. And um, however, um, working on growth, needing support, if there are any funders out there listening to this webinar, uh, and really at a stage of being able to step into all of their power. How do you see, where do you see the, the real strong growth about, of, you know, with our movement? And um, what would be some words of, of advice as you've been moving around the country and seeing how intersectionality is playing out? What do you think? I think, I think we're in an amazing time in history. You know, so many things are coming together, even though there are so many challenges that are out there. You know, we're dealing with plastic pollution in ways that we never thought about before. You know, both large plastics and then the microplastics that are going on. And they're finding their ways you know, into our lakes and our rivers, and of course, into our oceans that are going on. You know, we've got um, incredible work that's happening in the food justice space and dealing with food insecurity. And, you know, uh, sometimes folks think, well, you know, that's just an issue that's in certain parts of the country. It, you know, it is a rural issue, <laughs> which is amazing. And it is an urban issue that's going on. We have 24 million people in our country who are uh, currently food insecure. Um, so there are folks who are doing amazing work in that space and connecting it and also understanding the impacts that are happening from the climate crisis, you know, you know that that's connected also. When we see these droughts that are happening, that are affecting food production, that are really pushing many of our farmers to the edge, um, we also understand the connection that's in that space and drying out of our forest, and you know, causing these just um, amazing sets of wildfires that are going on. So it's all connected um, when we look at what's going on. You know, when we look at some of the fights that are going on around certified animal feeding operations and, and the impacts that are happening there. Um, you know, folks are, are linking up um, from different forms and, and different fashions of the sets of work that is going on. And then, you know, the, one of the most important um, and positive aspects uh, of this moment is young people. You know, I'm blessed that I get a chance to work with so many young people mm -hmm. all across the planet. And they understand intersectionality. They grew up with intersectionality. I, I used to say, you know, a holistic way of doing it. They say, oh, so you talk about intersectionality. I was like, yes, we, we, we will call it intersectionality. Then. And, um, you know, and, and let's, let's just unpack it a little bit further, Michelle. If we want to win on these issues, we got to get rid of the isms of the past. And I know it's hard because they are entrenched um, in so many different uh, forms uh, of the way that we live in our country. And what I mean by that is that racism and sexism, um, you know, um, find ways of separating folks, of weakening organizations and institutions and our country um, when we don't do that. And the beauty of young people is that they're leaving a lot of that, um, you know, the sins of the past in the, in the past. Um, and because of that, they are creating stronger movements where they see each other for who they are um, and not necessarily, you know, the color of someone's skin or their gender or any of those different types of things, um, which is really a powerful uh, 21st century paradigm to operate from. Um, so, you know, I'm excited about that because folks are also finally realizing that we have to create on ramps for folks, right? So we've got to be able to mm -hmm. have a number of different opportunities for folks because folks want to have different interests and two different skill sets. Um, so that's why in the work that I've done and, and, and others, you know, it's so important for us to be able to honor the work that needs to happen in the housing space and the transportation space and on the public health mm -hmm. side and all these other things. And COVID-19 for as devastating as it has been to both our country and the planet, uh, and the people um, and all of those, um, you know, in, in all of our countries is that it has also shown us where the gaps are in our system um, and, and how, you know, if you're in a rural community and I, you know, I come from, I often, you know, people will say, well, they're from, they're from a small town. And I'm like, no, if you are from someplace that has 500 people or less and two stop signs, like where I grew up, then yeah, you're from a small town. And, you know, it's interesting that COVID because COVID, you know, there are direct connections if you really understand this work 
uh, to COVID and climate, COVID and environmental injustice, mm -hmm. um, and a number of the other things, is that when it began to put this spotlight on the fact that you know, we got 24 million people who are living in physician deserts or medically underserved areas. And many folks who have been ex being exposed to toxic chemicals didn't have access uh, to medical treatment or did not have the uh, medical staff that had the expertise to be able to understand the dynamics that were happening from those exposures to many chemicals. Then we began to think more critically about that in a more larger context. And you can go down the laundry list of the things that COVID has done. It has shown that folks who are on the front lines, right? Folks who didn't work inside of an office, so they couldn't telework. They still needed to be able to get out there and, and try and still keep the lights on and put food on the table. COVID began to put a spotlight on the folks who had often been unseen and unheard. Um, so all of that ties into this new paradigm that we are developing around the work that we do and making sure that everybody is honored and valued. And let me just call it out because sometimes we have, even though black and brown and indigenous folks have been dehumanized in the past, we've got to also make sure that we don't dehumanize folks in the fossil fuel industry who were just working there. They weren't reaping the benefits from it and helping them to understand that there's a new set of opportunities in this new clean economy. Um, that they can also move into so that they can feel good about the work. They can get paid for this new set of work and they can make sure that their children, as our indigenous brothers and sisters say, for seven generations um, are going to be okay. And that's the new paradigm um, that I see many folks yes. moving toward or doing work in. Yes, yes, yes. Um, I, I didn't do my moderator's duty to tell folks to drop their questions into the Q&A. I see the numbers growing. So I'm going to keep I'm going to keep using moderated moderator privilege and chat for a little bit. Let's talk about some inside some inside stuff. So the US Environmental Protection Agency. God bless it. Right? I mean, uh, thousands and thousands of scientists and enforcers, you know, people would always say, "What do you do at EPA?" I, was, I would say, we do three things, Reached scientific research, science, remember that? <laughs> Promulgate standards and regulations and enforce them. That's what we did, right? Mm -hmm. And under the Obama administration, we had the opportunity to do a whole lot of organizing. We put environmental justice on the top of the priorities. And then it's back again now. You know, there was there was there was definitely a blip for the past four years. What do you think that Michael? I'm going to make you uh, the administrator. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> you know, Michael Reagan took this job, yes. And what what do you think that uh, the administrator should be doing? Uh, I will I will start out by saying one thing that I think that they should be doing, and this connects to some of the things that people are interested in in the Q&A. I think that we have to rebuild the workforce. Mm -hmm. And thankfully, there were um, there are a number of people out there, young people, who we can get them on in mm -hmm. to be able to do this thing in the intersectional way. Um, but there is, you know, there is, there is, there's a lot of, there's a lot of trauma from, you know, all of the really incredible people that had to leave and we had to rebuild the workforce. What, what do you think that the administrator should be doing? Well, Michael's already doing a lot of great things, you know, he, he's, um, you know, centering the organization again on science. Um, he's also called out just a couple of days ago in his latest memo about environmental justice and climate and, and really making sure that folks understand that that is a priority. You know, the other thing that's going to be so critically important in this moment um, is beginning to move forward on cumulative impacts. You know, it doesn't matter hardly any community you come from, there are multiple sets of impacts that are going on, you know, synergistic impacts, a number of other things that are happening. Uh, you know, we think about it in the toxic space, you know, folks are being bombarded in some instances by a number of different chemicals. Um, and, and you need to be able to have a protocol 
um, a, a, a process, if you will, that begins to strongly uh, take that into consideration and then begin to take steps to be able to minimize those impacts and then hopefully one day to be able to completely eliminate those. So cumulative, uh, a cumulative impact uh, analysis and framework is gonna be so critically important. We see a couple of states now that are moving forward on it. Uh, New Jersey passed a law um, you know, to, to begin to address that. We've gotta have it across our country. It's so critically important. Because as the planet continues to change because of what's going on with climate emergencies and climate crises, uh, as it, temperatures began to increase significantly by the time we get to the mid-century, then there are going to be additional impacts that are going to happen from toxics, right? Um, there are going to be other types of impacts that are going to happen. You're going to have these, you know, you're going to continue to have these extreme rain events. You're going to have all these other things that are happening that we need to have an evolving cumulative impact sort of framework um, that understands that it has to evolve um, as these new sets of both existing uh, and future impacts begin to happen. So that is one of the things that um, if I was EPA administrator, I would begin to think critically about and I would begin to also incorporate all these other agencies and departments that are gonna be so critically necessary. I'll be working hand in hand with HHS and CDC and ATSDR and a number of others to say, let's sit down and from a scientific uh, standpoint, begin to really unpack this and let's walk through it with stakeholders so that there's real transparency in it um, and so that folks understand. And of course, them playing a role also. Let me just call this out. The agency, and I, and I know Michael, he's, he's a fantastic, he's a fantastic mm -hmm. person and I know he will do all that he can. We've got to make sure that we're also honoring community-based participatory research. We have to make sure that we're honoring traditional mm -hmm. environmental knowledge and all of the various uh, ways that we yes. look at science coming together and honoring that um, because there is wisdom that exists in all of those spaces and places. And that will make one, folks know that they are a part of the process but two people will support that. And they'll also give you space um, when you maybe aren't as far along as you would hope to be because they are a part of what is going on. Um, so that is an opportunity. The other part of it is we gotta get serious about enforcement, right? And we've gotta get serious also, you know, we're always serious about compliance, um, but we need to let folks know that there is a set of expectations that you are gonna do the right thing. Now we're lucky that many businesses and industries do try to do the right thing. And then you've got the, the folks who are rogue. You know, Michelle, you know me, I give real talk. So you got some folks who is like, you know what? The fine is this amount. I'm gonna make this amount of money. Which one you think they are gonna go with, right? But that's not everybody. Mm -hmm. So I don't wanna put a broad brush on folks, but we've gotta get serious about enforcement. We gotta get serious about Title VI and letting folks know that you cannot use federal funds to uh, discriminate uh, against communities of color. And we also understand the whole, you know, there's a big thing about uh, intent and effect. And I understand the Supreme Court cases and we can, we can go into a law conversation with folks if anybody ever is interested in that. But we've got an opportunity to actually take a look at our civil rights laws and especially Title VI and to ask the really tough questions about what is it that we need to do to make this in the environmental context um, have more meaning. It's been effective mm -hmm. in both transportation and housing. So if it can be effective in, in transportation and housing, we have to make sure that it's also effective on the environmental side. And again, this kind of goes back to uh, the enforcement side of it. We've got to say, if the state is not willing to do the right thing, then you've got to be willing to pull those resources. And I know that is a tough conversation for folks but folks got to know that, 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 you're, that you're serious and that you're real. And that's not to take away from anyone to say that folks who have been practitioners uh, in this space are not serious. But if you've been around for 40 or 50 years and you have not yet once done that, then folks is like, well, okay, uh, you know, I think I can go ahead and sort of skate around and navigate and those types of things. Now, all that being said, in the state context, you gotta make sure that the states have the resources and the tools that they need to be able to do the job right. And then we've gotta wrap all of this. And everybody, please listen to this 
tiny part that I'm going to share with you that's so critically important. And, it, and we're talking about the federal family right now, but this moves from the federal to the state, to the county, to the local, and to our organizations. Mm -hmm. We have to make sure that people have the competencies to be able to do the job right. And if you can't, if they don't, and if they're not willing to evolve into that space and to do that, you got to go out and get other people. Um, and if we're not willing to make sure that folks have those competencies, we're going to continue to fall short. Um, and that means that, you know, we're going to have to make investments to make sure that that becomes real. If I was the EPA administrator, those are a few of the things that I would do along with some work they're already doing. So, you know, me, if you're doing a good job, I lift you up. And if you aren't, I'm going to say, Hey, you ain't doing it right. And I'm going to call you out is that we've got to move quicker, but we got to make sure that the science is strong and actually better understanding you all know that there's a ton of chemicals that are out there that we have not yet went through um, the analyses that are necessary we've got to expand and make sure that that process is moving forward um, in, in a um, in a faster way um, and that's so mm -hmm. critically important um, because people have been able to fall back for far too long and saying well we just don't know yet um, or, you know, we're still in the phase of evaluating that. Okay, well, how long are you going to take? Um, because as long as we're taking, people are being impacted, people are being infected, people, um, our lives are being shortened, uh, and that cannot be acceptable. That speaks to our humanity and some of the decisions mm -hmm. we make between profit and people's lives. And that's not as a slogan. You, you hear that often. The reality of the situation is that I've worked in over 700 communities now, some, maybe more than that from what people say. And I can't tell you how many times when I, when I take a look, I can say, you know what? They made a choice, uh, a financial choice over doing the extra that was necessary to keep people safe. And we just can't have that that cannot be a part of the paradigm moving forward. We've got too many challenges that are coming um, and in this moment, and it's no longer, it does not have to be the way that people do business. Oh, it definitely cannot be the way that we do business in the future. And so since you brought up the business of our work, I'm going to start bringing in a few of the questions. And one of the questions that, um, an activist that is listening to us today is asking, how can someone convince officials to stop giving polluters permits and stop environmental racism? I'll, you know, whether or not this person lives, I, you know, I think this person lives in Michigan actually. So, you know, you can go local or you can go uh, federal, but, you know, I, I would say that there is a lot of opportunity right now to be able to increase the civic space, mm -hmm. to be able to get some attention to this, right? Uh, and also what the federal government is doing and with bringing attention to these issues. I know that we have an incredible new person at EPA that is working on the backlog of you know, civil rights complaints. Mm -hmm. And I thank this woman for going in to do that. There's also a lot of different, um, a lot of different uh, acknowledgements um, decisions, policies that are coming out. And I remember when the endangerment finding actually happened, we took that and, you know, you're going to tell it, you're going to say that if we say that greenhouse gases is a threat to public health, you could take that a very long way. In Oregon, uh, we do have a, a tradition of uh, some of our legislature leaving uh, when we bring up very important environmental uh, regulatory or legislative opportunity. Uh, so, you know, it depends on what state you're in, but this person is asking from Michigan, but I would love for you to be able to uh, drop some science, shall we say, on what are some of the best ways to be able to stop uh, polluters and stop environmental racism. Well, that, that's a long question. So the first way um, yes. for legislators <laughs> is vote them out. Really, I mean, it's really that 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 has to be a part of it, making sure that people understand that you understand the power that exists inside of your vote, and that if they're not willing to do the right thing, that that is going to be an outcome of their lack of action or lack of bad actions. Um, when it comes to 
these companies uh, that um, you know are, are are not being good players. You know, the Environmental Protection Agency has some power in that space, right? So once again, we can strengthen some enforcement. We can make sure that inspectors are going out there. We can make sure that we're evaluating the impacts that are happening. We can also utilize our performance partnership agreements with the states. Um, because in the EPA, as an example, about 80% of the programs are delegated to the states. But there's also that relationship that happens through PPAs and PPGs, uh, performance partnership agreements and performance partnership grants. In other words, how the dollars are flowing in some instances. Um, so we can make sure that we're beginning to also build additional language that's in there that is more protective of communities. Um, and we can also make sure that there are these real conversations happening with the states about what the sets of expectations are with the dollars that they're receiving. So, you know, folks need to just make sure that they're thinking more critically about that. The other part of it, and you've seen recently in the civic side, um, when folks started to get real funky, and yeah, I'm going to move past my scientific language and my legal language and just have real language, uh, in Georgia, uh, when they decided to put these uh, very antiquated sets of uh, Jim Crow-like actions in place, that folks said, really? Okay, so not only are we going to put pressure on you, but we're also going to put pressure on the, on the companies um, that are there in, in the state that are benefiting from our dollars. Um, and we should be actually looking at, and I know some organizations have been a part of this, but you know, we need to get these stronger sets of uh, economic boycott frameworks in place to let folks know mm -hmm. that you will no longer utilize our dollars to poison our communities, um, to um, impact our planet, that we will um, get engaged on that side of the ledger as well, along with litigation that folks um, sometimes will utilize um, and a number of these other things. So it is not a, a one size fits all. It is a multiple set of tools that we have in our toolkit to address um, both the legislators, which in many, many instances, and we're gonna have real talk, are tied to dollars that are coming from certain entities. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we need to make sure that we're not only exposing that, but understanding that we have our own sets of power. Now, how do we expand that power? We have to begin to make sure that we're reaching across uh, to folks who maybe aren't traditionally a part of our, our community, um, or maybe are not directly working on the exact same set of issues so that we are building stronger, more broad, and then eventually deeper organizations, finding and making sure that we are focusing on our commonalities. And that also means that sometimes you got to give up some power um, and, and that you've got to um, also begin to share resources. And these are some of the ways that you know, what I really appreciate about somebody like Reverend Barber is that he makes sure that the poor people's movement is a movement that looks like our country, right? So even though there are mm -hmm. impacts that are happening in African-American communities and there are impacts that are happening in Latinx communities and there are impacts that are happening in lower wealth and working class white communities, they are focused on the commonality of a set of, uh, of priorities. Um, and everyone gets around those um, and they continue to push to make change happen. And they don't let folks come in and, and break them apart. You know, they're, they're asking for basic amenities, right? When you're saying $15 an hour or a, a livable wage or whatever that might be, you know, that is something that everyone can get their mind around. There is a commonality that's in that space. Mm -hmm. um, and there are a number of other pieces. So I say all that to say, that we're in this moment right now, right? Where, yes, we have a new set of opportunities that are coming and you would think that any politician would just look out there and say, you know what? I could literally begin to have thousands of new jobs in my district. That would just make sense because then people would say, well, you know, while underneath of my watch, you know, tax bases increased. And out of those tax bases, there was a stronger set of educational opportunities because we could fund some of the things that we had to cut in the past. And we can go down the laundry list of, you know, before we were gonna close that rural clinic or that hospital because we just didn't have the resources, but now because we've got this new set of economic opportunities, new people are starting to move in and we've got the resources to actually make sure that that clinic or that hospital um, is still in place. That's the moment that we find ourselves in, but we can't let people separate us like they traditionally have 
And, and that's why mm -hmm. a multiracial, mm -hmm. multi-generational set of movements and opportunities is needed um, to actually hold politicians accountable. And let me just be clear with everybody. I don't care if you're a Democrat, a Republican, or an independent. If you're not mm -hmm. doing right, then you don't deserve to be in office. And that's the difference in the way that we have to think. Now, we know there are <laughs> party who hasn't traditionally been supportive of some of the things that we're talking about, but that does not mean that some folks cannot evolve. And we should be judging folks based upon yes. their votes and their actions um, and not necessarily their party, right? If you say, you know, you're an RD and I, and you're willing to do the right thing, then folks should give you a fair look mm -hmm. and we should be making sure that we're supporting those who actually care about what's going on. Huh? I am unstable. Sorry, I'm, I went I went off video because I got I had an, an unstable moment. <laughs> but I'm I will come back on video in a moment. But I could definitely hear. Um, so I want to dig deeper into what you just brought up about how we're going to actually get politicians to do what they should be doing. Mm -hmm. Right. So the environmental justice movement uh, has dealt with backlash for the, you know, for the, the 40 years it's been in existence, right? Mm -hmm. And at this particular moment, any, any movement that has the word justice in it is dealing with this backlash from the far right. And however, we are not losing. I mean, there are some places that we're losing, but we're not losing. Um, we're getting stronger right now. Mm -hmm. So could you bring some of the background that you have in working all around the country to help us think about places where activists are using certain tools to be able to address this, to push back on, um, push back on the far right, to push back on the pushback. You know, I will say here in Portland, we, you know, had the most, had the only successful climate justice battle, uh, ballot initiative passed with the Portland Clean Energy Fund last year, which also ushered in the first, uh, well, that was, it was, was that last year? It was the year before COVID, you know, the COVID year just sort of disappeared. Um, but it also ushered in the first African-American leader for the city as well. So obviously tying in what you bring up in terms of you got to vote them out and vote them in. But could you give us a little bit of your um, expansiveness experience around the country and give us some examples of uh, just, people are just asking, can you give us some, can you give us some examples so we can have some joy <laughs> about where folks are winning, right? Yeah. And also and also being able to um, pinpoint a strategy or two that might be helpful uh, in this moment uh, against the far right. Yeah. Well, we're winning all kinds of places. You, I mean, you turn TV on and you see many of these laws, um, you know, the folks have been trying to put on the books, you know, around voting, you know, the courts, you know, that'll go to the courts, um, along with a strong Department of Justice, um, you know, once we get everybody in place there to address many of these egregious sets of behaviors and, and litigation that's going on. But we're winning. Um, in, in a broader context, I hope people understand that this is, this is such an amazing moment with, with so many opportunities. You have all of these new, fresh voices on Capitol Hill. You see the, you know, some of the negative things and the fights that go on, but, you know, you have these incredible uh, new folks who have joined, you know, you have Cori Bush um, and, and a number of other uh, new leaders coming, you know, who have environmental justice backgrounds um, who are winning. Um, and you've seen many of the, you got Deb Holland now leaving Capitol Hill and going over to uh, the Department of Interior. You know, you got to give it up um, for Deb and you know the work that Deb is going to do. And Deb came in a few years mm -hmm. ago on that set of energy that was going on. Man, uh, you know, you've got uh, John Ossoff, 
and Raphael Warnock coming up out of Georgia. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so one, it's transformational to have an African American center and a Jewish senator coming, you know, out of the South, but also the work that they're doing there uh, on Capitol Hill on the Senate side of living up to many of the things that they said that they wanted to do. And it was not them, it was what their constituencies across the state said, these are the things that we care about. Uh, and then being able to bring that forward. And then if you look at, you know, all these incredible sets of work that's happening in the states and not just on the coast, you know, California is always gonna be, you know, kind of leading the edge on, on many issues. And, and then of course, uh, folks, um, you know, moving up the coast as well in Washington state and folks there in Oregon, the work that you're doing. Um, and not just the, you know, there's some incredible work that's happening in New York state and in New Jersey. We talked about that a little mm -hmm. bit, but then you can even come on down you can come down um, to the work that's going on in Pennsylvania. Um, and, and folks actually, I just did this um, event with folks the other day where they're putting these environmental justice hubs in place in, in, in Pennsylvania, in both rural areas and in urban areas and, and bringing all these different types of folks together, folks from frontline communities, from governmental spaces, from business spaces, from tech spaces, uh, and beginning to put together these plans based upon in the region of the state where they are, what is the things that they're looking for? Um, and then figuring out ways to link the, the resources and the language that they've now moved forward on there in the state um, to make uh, these transformational sets of opportunities happen. And, and you're starting to see these things happen you know, across the country. If you go over to New Mexico, some really interesting things that are going on there. Um, around uh, restorative justice um, and around uh, agricultural justice issues and, and a few other things. Um, you see things happening that I wasn't sure I was gonna see in my lifetime. You know, you see dollars going back to black farmers, um, you know, whose land was taken away um, and, and their numbers shrank and shrank and shrank and shrank. Um, I'm hoping that we do it also in the Latinx context because lots of times people don't talk about yes. Latinx farmers who also face some very similar sets of challenges. When they were lynching uh, black folks in the South, they were also lynching Latinx brothers and sisters as well um, and snatching land away. So, you know, there's all this really positive things that are happening. And then I would be remiss if I didn't also talk about, you know, the, the folks who are getting together on the technology side. Um, and mm -hmm. really looking at um, a suite of opportunities that, you know, Silicon Valleys don't have to just be in California. There are opportunities, that, go back to Pennsylvania real quick, look at the transformative change that happened in Pittsburgh. So I grew up not too far from there. Um, and I remember when Pittsburgh was a steel town and when the skies used to be dark. Now I was really, really young back then but I still you know, follow the pictures and listen to my elders and the stories that they used to tell. And now, you know, it is a technology hub. Now that may not be something for everyone, but let me just share this with folks. Here's the other dynamic that's going on. And I so hope that Oregon makes decisions about how it wants to be in this space. You know, this new clean economy that folks often talk about is so much broader and wider uh, then we often talk about it. It is, yes, it is solar and wind. Yes, it is thermal and tidal. Uh, uh, yes, it is some of the new tech applications, but it is also a number of other things that will fill this space. You know, when I go back home, I like to use myself as an example. When I go back home, not only have all the coal mines continued to shrink and shrink and shrink for decades upon decades upon decades, but many of the, the um, industries that were there have shuttered their doors or now literally on life support. And I think about all these opportunities that exist around advanced manufacturing. I know the folks in Oregon are just like the folks in Appalachia in the sense that you work great with both your hands and your mind. And I think about, you know, folks who are positioning themselves in the traditional locations that we always think about folks in relationship to sort of a green or clean economy, you know, folks in New York and, and folks in California. And I think, wow, you know, we could have all these new advanced manufacturing uh, opportunities that are going on in the communities that I lived in, you know, where opioids have taken over because people lost hope and because people no longer felt that 
that they mattered. And we find that in both the rural and urban spaces, but a lot in the, ur in, in the rural spaces, we've got opportunities to change that dynamic now if we wanna position ourselves. And as a country, because if we don't, we all know China will, and a number of other, uh, other countries will, we've got this moment now where we get a chance to lead and lead in a way that um, allows us to, to show our humanity to at the same time, really start to help folks to build wealth again. Something that has been fleeting for far too many communities across our country. Mm -hmm. Imagine that, imagine that. Get outside mm -hmm. of our urban cores where we need to build wealth as well. But lots of the places where I know what it feels like to be unseen and unheard. We can change that dynamic. Yes and we can make sure that people know that they're valued and that they're needed. Yes, yes, yes. We have to we have to have a mix in this economy, you know. I, it is true. When we started talking about the green economy, we were just in a certain sectors. It really is everything. And that's the power of the moment that we're in, that everybody is thinking that way. You know, John Podesta is like talking about all of this and, you know, the, everybody is people that you would never have thought like really wow okay even though we've been shouting it from the rooftops for so long but all of the beltway folks are 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 in this space and it's awesome Mustafa, i'm going to ask if we it's 7 26 and i'm going to ask if we could keep talking for until 7 40 because there are two there are two spaces that I really want to be able to get to. Um, one is there have been a lot of questions from folks about uh, the career piece. It's it's really interesting. Um, you know, I uh, a number of people have have put in questions or in the chat about they're at either a large environmental organization, you know, like the one that you're that you're working for now or that I'm on the board of. Um, or uh, they are trying to get into the space. They're trying to break into the space uh, to work on environmental justice, climate justice. Mm -hmm. you know, um, and you know, one of the questions was, do you need a PhD? And I will emphatically say, you do not have a P you do not need a PhD. I do not have a PhD. I have had the honor and opportunity to manage people with PhDs and work with scientists and engineers. But as I said, this is this is an opportunity to work on any part of your life because actually our climate crisis is an economic crisis mm -hmm. our economy is built on you know on greenhouse gases so we have to actually uh, we have to actually tear apart <laughs> and build back and that is that that affects everything so um, uh, before I turn to you to talk a little bit about you know, how people can get involved. You know, I have to say that, uh, first of all, there are a lot of universities that have centers that are run by people of color that are doing this work on environmental justice. And, you know, whether it's in the deep South or it's in New York and the new school or all the way in between, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of places and spaces where you can get involved. You know, write down and look up Green 2.0, Environmental Justice Leadership Forum, uh, you know, and I want to say that do not sleep on government service. Mm -hmm. So I've done this work in local government, state government, and federal government, and we need good people there. You get incredible training, and you can also make a difference. Hence, look at Mustafa. So Mustafa, what what would you what would you say about uh, folks trying to break in? You know, and you know this this. This question about even breaking in is is really yeah. interesting to me because I remember when nobody wanted, you know, <laughs> that we were just trying to, we were, you know, we were trying to get a, you know, a piece of meat, like something, you know, right. um, but also the challenges of being at a larger uh, environmental or straighter environmental or climate organization as folks are trying to make these changes to embrace equity. How's that going for you? <laughs> I mean, again, this is the moment. Uh, I can't tell you how many jobs people pass to me on a, almost a daily basis 
um, that are environmental justice and climate justice positions um, that they are beginning to fill. Now, I ask them to make sure that you're doing it in an authentic way and for the right reasons. Um, but, you know, folks are going to make the choices that they make, and then you have to evaluate um, those entities for yourself to make sure that they, they line up with your values and, and that, um, you know, you can do a couple quick things. You can look at their board, you can look at their senior staff, and you can look at their strategic plan, and it'll probably tell you um, exactly who they are uh, in their evolutionary journey, I'll say it that way. There are, as Michelle said, you know, academic uh, institutions that, that are gonna have a number of additional positions that are gonna be in this space. I can't tell you, and it, again, this is a, um, a monumental moment that companies are building uh, opportunities around environmental justice and climate justice because they understand that is the energy that's inside of our country right now. Um, and they understand also that they need to be positioning themselves and doing the right things in relationship uh, to climate change um, and, and doing it in a way that meets um, both the needs that are happening from frontline communities uh, and uh, whatever their sets of uh, goals and visions are for their organization. You find that um, these big organizations, right? So both conservation organizations, climate organizations, environmental organizations are creating all these different positions, uh, both at senior levels and, and, um, and on all the way down um, and getting you know, folks engaged in these sets of work on Capitol Hill and both um, in many state houses. Look at those opportunities as well because that gives you a, a different set uh, a different uh, uh, set of skill sets, if I can say it that way. Um, in my 24, mm -hmm. uh, 24 years of federal service, I spent two years on Capitol Hill uh, working for John Conyers and learned an incredible amount um, at that time. So there are new sets of opportunities that are there as well. So I say all that to say, and again, you just have to evaluate whom you might be working for and, and the direction they're going. Here's the other part that we need to have as, as this conversation really give strong consideration to creating your own business, mm -hmm. your own mm -hmm. nonprofit, your own whatever the label is for, for the work that you do, because for the first time ever, there is significant resources. So there's gonna need to be both in the traditional sort of organizations, you know, this work is being integrated in. You may have a whole different view of how you wanna, how you wanna do things. Um, and that's why it's so important for you to have the flexibility of having your own uh, organization, your own entity. So yes, I am the uh, vice president at the National Wildlife Federation, but I am also the founder and CEO of Revitalization Strategies, because I understand that I need to be able to say and do what uh, needs to be done to help to continue to push uh, for all this change that we keep talking about. So I tell folks, you should always uh, be thinking about embracing your entrepreneurialism um, and, and creating your own entity, if that is something um, that resonates with you. Um, so there are so many different opportunities that are in front of us um, to, to be able to mm -hmm. find ways to do good. Um, and people will say, as you said, Michelle, well, do you have to have a PhD uh, or do you have to have um, one of the other advanced degrees? The answer is no. The smartest people that I've ever met mm -hmm did not have, they had PhDs, but they had PhDs in life, um, you know, mm -hmm. and the sets of experiences um, that they did. That doesn't take anything away from formal education. It is, it is important and it is valuable, but you can do this work. Maybe you love, you're a great writer, you're needed. Maybe you are someone else who's in the mm -hmm. creative space and we can talk about that. Maybe you are someone uh, who's great at app development. Maybe you are someone um, who, you know, of course, enjoys the law. Um, maybe you're someone you know, who wants to be in the public health space. Maybe you're someone um, who um, loves being outdoors. So I just did a bunch of work with a bunch of ra um, you know, rangers um, you know, who work in the parks. Um, or you, know, you could be someone who is, you know, loves uh, agricultural work. All of the things are necessary and important in this moment that's going on. And it all ties to environmental justice and climate justice issues. So um, 
you know, just don't be afraid. Just, just get it. But the most important thing is also build real authentic partnerships um, and get great sets of mentors um, because they will be able to help you mm -hmm. navigate um, many of the, you know, so everybody should call or write Michelle and ask her to be your mentor. <laughs> <laughs> And Ms. Daffa, let me tell you, if anybody links in with me and asks me questions, I, I respond. I, you know, I remember the, the time when I was, mm -hmm. you know, I had just graduated from, from, from law school and learned about environment and environmental policy in law school. That's where I actually, and then I went to region two to do a clinical. And I was like, this is it. I'm, you know, okay. I'm, I'm sold. And I just knew I was going to go work for the US EPA. And there was a hiring freeze at that during that mm -hmm. year. So I did not. And I always joked, you know, 20 years later, when I came back, and some of the same people were there, see, I'm finally, I'm finally here. So no, you know, it's not, it's not gumdrops and raisins. <laughs> right. You know, right. uh, <clears throat> you, you gotta like, we, we, we gotta pick ourselves up and figure it out but uh there's so many people we there's so many people out there who um you can connect to the world is it's so much easier through mm -hmm. through um our, our network lives so yes um so i wanted to uh give you the last couple of minutes to um say anything that you wanted to say um your your pearls of wisdom um you know, there's so many places and directions that we didn't get a chance to talk about. Um, one of the things that I wanted to just lift up was when you were talking about tribal ecological knowledge. Mm -hmm. We, you know, here in Oregon, one of the reasons why I was, was really wanting to uh, get out of New York, New York City at that moment, Fifth Avenue, was because I was missing, I was missing being able to lift up and work with sovereign nations. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, tribal, the tribal consultation policies that, you know, the, the US EPA put in place and, and all of that, um, uh, that was that was that was for me my most fulfilling work as a as a servant leader at US EPA and um, you know I know when you were in the environmental justice office we worked together to be able to figure out how we could lift up the work at the intersection of sovereignty and environmental justice mm -hmm. so um, even though I'm giving you the floor to be able to uh, provide whatever pearls of wisdom you could. I did realize that, you know, I did not have the opportunity to thank the elders who have stewarded the land that I that I am living in in Portland, Oregon, the traditional tribes of Multnomah, Waskow, and Kaplamet, and many other, many other indigenous tribes that have stewarded this land forever. And so I I would love for you to touch on that for a moment. Just, mm -hmm. you know, consultation NGOs working with with sovereign nations, uh, and and then um, and then let us know anything else you wanted to uh, talk to us about. And I wish we had a whole nother hour for you and I to be in conversation. Um, but uh, I I do want to thank Lisa and her team for being able to bring us together. So Mustafa. Yeah. Well, you know, in, Indigenous brothers and sisters have guided my work um, long even before I first started doing this. You know, whether it's the indigenous brothers and sisters here um, in North America, um, the indigenous brothers and sisters in South America, particularly in Brazil that I've worked with, mm -hmm. the indigenous brothers and sisters in Africa, uh, which are also indigenous brothers and sisters. And then the work um, that I've done uh, in Australia with the aboriginal uh, brothers and sisters who are indigenous. And when you think about um, the lessons that they've taught us and how they have been able to live in harmony um, with their environments. It then brings us back to honoring that work that we do here in the States, you know, as you mentioned in, in our consultation and in making sure that we are uplifting the sets of opportunities for them to make sure that their voices are framing out the direction that we need to go into. I'm really hopeful that uh, our new administration not only understands that, but honors that. And that we begin to make sure that these traditional lands are protected 
that we are making sure that our indigenous brothers and sisters have the resources that they need um, to not only continue to protect those cultural spaces, um, but for them to also be able to uh, continue to um, do what they do so well. And that is help us to understand our spirituality um, as well as sort of the things that we do, you know, on legislative sides and policy sides. Um, sometimes we miss that, right? The, the real cultural and spirituality aspect that should naturally be an anchoring point in all the work that we do. You know, um, you know what is so critically important is that we have to realize that we have power unless we give it away. They don't teach us about power in elementary school. They don't teach you about it in middle school. Um, if you learn about it in high school, you're very fortunate. Sometimes you have to get to college and you may go your whole life without anybody actually really anchoring you and teaching you about power. And there's a reason for that. Because once you realize that you actually have power, then you, your expectations rise. That certain things that have gone on inside of communities are, is no longer acceptable because you realize that it doesn't have to be. That's what this moment brings forward. All that hard work that has been going on in the AIM movement, in the civil rights movement, in the Chicano movement, um, and, and a number of other movements that now moving forward and saying that no matter who you are and where you come from, that you have power and that you have the right to be able to utilize that to make this world a better place, to make our country a better place, to make our most vulnerable communities a better place. And that's what I would leave with everyone. Thank you to Beyond Toxics. Thank you to the NAACP. Thank you to all the activists and advocates who are watching or will watch. And just remember that you have power. In those tough times, when things seem like they're insurmountable, you have power. In the good times, which hopefully will be going on for a while, that you have power. And that even when we are moving in a positive direction, you are so needed to continue to push, to make sure that we take it just that next step further, because that next step further may be the difference in protecting someone's life and helping to build real, um, you know, mm -hmm. a strong economic bases underneath of someone, and also helping folks to know that change is not just something that we have to hope for, but that change can actually happen. So I want to thank each mm -hmm. and every one of you. Thank you, Mustafa. When we are in crisis, accelerate. And this is a moment of acceleration. No matter who is in, you know, sitting in the house, we have to keep people accountable and we have to be in our own power. Thank you very much to Beyond Toxics. Thank you very much for the NAACP. I turn it back over to Haley and Lisa. Thank you so much, Michelle. And I would, in, I would like to invite Lisa to provide some words and then I will help close it out. So go ahead, Lisa. Thank you for this opportunity just to send you both like the biggest virtual hug ever. My greatest respect. I learned so much. I took copious notes. But what I want to end on is just to thank you, Mustafa, for really pointing out that any truly reparative and restorative action has to acknowledge that racism is at the basis of fractures in our institutional policies and our community vulnerability. So just thank you for continuing to drive that home. And uh, Michelle, thank you for being also the leader and mentor we all wish to walk in your steps. Thank you. And I also want to thank NAACP for being our amazing partners in this work. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Lisa. And I would like to say some closing words before we end. So thank you so much, Michelle and Mustafa. I'm honored to be here today with you both and with all of the attendees. And I specifically wanna thank you for talking about effective meaningful tribal consultation. That is something that I've always cared about from childhood, being an enrolled member of the Confederated Tribes, the Slutz Indians, and a descendant of the Klamath Tribes, the Europe Tribe. 
and the Skokogan Bad and Chippewa Indians. And I feel like I've learned so much in this short amount of time and I hope others have experienced the same. And I hope all of the attendees know that the fight for environmental and climate justice is, an, is ongoing as we can all see and can only be achieved if we come together as community members and build collective power. And I hope we also recognize that without each other and without the cultural and natural resources, including our plant and animal relatives in our water and air that make us who we are, we cannot move forward. And I cannot believe that we are at the end of this summit and so much has gone into planning this event and I am so thankful for this moment. And I am thankful that I had this opportunity to help bring together such great activists and leaders. And finally, I'm thankful for my team here at both Beyond Toxics and the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, Eugene Springfield Unit. So thank you so much. And thank you to all who have taken part in this moment with us. And so I would like to end the first Environmental Justice Pathway Summit. And I hope you can join us next year. And we're going to continue these conversations and continue this fight. So thank you. Hi everyone.